Okay, we're going to get started tonight. Um, so my job will be to uh, ultimately introduce our guest speaker tonight, Andrew Kovacs, but before doing so, I just wanted to say a little bit about the lecture series. Um, to reiterate something I said in the email to the students, I, I think it's a really important part of the school's culture. It's um, you know, really one of the few events that is meant to be for the entire school. So it's great that you guys are here. Please keep coming. Um, bring your friends. We're going to have the second lecture of the spring series on Friday. Um, and it'll take place in the atrium. And it'll be by uh, two other visiting critics, um, Evie and Joffer, who together run new affiliates. Um, and after that lecture in the atrium, Professor Munley will provide a response. Uh, on Monday, one week from yesterday, um, we'll have an opening for the exhibition of work produced by the late Kermit J. Lee, Jr., uh, a former professor here as well as a graduate of the program. And his daughter, uh, Karen George, will provide some remarks at that exhibition opening, uh, which will take place in the marble room. Um, so back to Andrew. Actually, before I introduce Andrew, I'll also mention that after Andrew's talk, uh, which will last about 50 minutes, um, Professor Rosa has agreed and will give a response to the lecture, so hence the two chairs. Um, and uh, together that will just run for an extra 10 or 15 minutes. So we know that many of you often use that 30 second gap after the lecture concludes to excuse yourself. Please don't do that. It's a bit distracting. Please stick around for, for the kind of final 10, 15 minute um, session in which Richard and Andrew will have a bit of a, a discussion, and then we'll take questions um, from all of you. Uh, okay, now to Andrew. Um, Andrew Kovacs has a long list of accolades, which you can read in his bio, so I'd only like to call attention to a few things um, that may resonate here. Uh, most importantly, Andrew is a graduate of our program, earning his bachelor's degree uh, in 2006. Um, both during and after his time in Syracuse, Andrew worked at OMA in Rotterdam, Atelier Bauwau in Tokyo, and, and Rex in New York City. Um, Andrew's also a graduate of Princeton University, earning his master's degree in 2012. While at Princeton, uh, he received the Howard Crosby Butler Traveling Fellowship in Architecture, uh, which enabled him to travel to Kazakhstan to study the architecture and urban plans of important developing cities in that country. Um, from 2012 to 2013, Andrew served as the inaugural teaching fellow at UCLA, um, where he's taught for many years since then. Alongside teaching and as the leader of Office Kovacs, his office, um, Andrew's constantly featured in important publication series and exhibitions, uh, most notably a solo show at the Jai and Jai Gallery in LA in 2013, uh, the Graham Foundation sponsored exhibition and publication series Treatise in 2015, uh, the Chicago Architecture Biennial in 2017, and um, more recently a special issue of A Plus U in 2017 um, that profiled emerging architects in the U.S. Um, so there he was alongside um, many friends of the program, the LADG, Young and Ayata, Bureau Spectacular, Mark Gage, and Ellie Abrams. Most recently, Andrews designed and built large-scale installations um, at both the Coachella Valley Arts and Music Festival as well as uh, in the Morongo Valley Desert, projects I suspect he'll share with us tonight. Another project you might be familiar with, Archive of Affinities. Um, it is uh, an image collection um, that Andrew's been curating for over 10 years. It's, it's taken many forms, uh, a Tumblr blog uh, and now an Instagram page. Um, he describes it as a project with no deadline, no client, and no budget, therefore totally useless, and a project of pure passion. Andrew's interest here is to collect works that exist on the periphery of the discipline of architecture, which allows the limits of the discipline to be challenged, expanded, contracted, and refined. Uh, he writes, what is prohibited in the canon is acceptable, even desired for archive of affinities. Um, if you haven't checked it out, um, please do. It's quite um, fascinating to kind of watch this collection grow and a kind of categorization of these images emerge. Um, I just told Andrew I was gonna do this and it made him nervous, but I wanted to briefly recall the first time Andrew and I met 10 years ago at a dive bar on the south side of Chicago called the Skylark. He remembers, I think. Um, at this first meeting, polite conversation turned quickly into heated debate. I'm not sure how it happened. I think a third person instigated it. The topic of this debate was new urbanism, a heated, a heated topic. Uh, one of us was arguing that this movement was fraught with false nostalgia and detrimental to contemporary architecture. 
The other was arguing that new urbanism was becoming wildly popular among broader audiences, something that we should not immediately dismiss. I recall this first meeting not to reveal Andrew's secret obsession with new urbanism, uh, but to call attention to a strategy that Andrew has employed for more than 10 years now. It's not an approach to architectural design invented by Andrew, but one that was uh, more or less discarded for a period of time um, as a result of the novelty chasing that coincided with the availability of and fascination with all things digital. Where others dismiss the capacity of the everyday, the found object, the lowbrow, the ready-made, the familiar, or the suspiciously popular, Andrew finds latent potential, not in those things in and of themselves, but in clever reimagination and combination of existing artifacts. Here I was going to quote Andrew quoting Robert Venturi, but I saw his slides and it's in the third slide, so I'll let you have that one. Uh, capitalizing on comfort that results from availability and familiarity of everyday objects, Andrew is constantly seeking to make architecture intellectually and visually available to a wider audience while advancing contemporary discourse on the topics of aesthetics, composition, and image making. Andrew's particular approach to architecture has rendered him a rather polarizing figure in contemporary architecture culture. What's viewed by some as a rejection of or a reaction against contemporary experimental architecture tied to digital technique, I know to be a personally motivated and self-guided adventure into the underappreciated relics from our discipline's history and a project that's indifferent to trend. I'd like to end with another quote from Andrew. I hope this one wasn't in the slides. Uh, it's an answer he gave in an interview when asked to share his definition of architecture. Uh, I quite enjoyed his response. He stated, Architecture is shelter, it is thinking, it is beauty, it is representation, it is graphic, it is form, it is program, it is event, it is art, it is history, it is function, it is money, it is clients, it is gravity, it is codes, it is zoning, it is structure, it is construction, it is demolition, it is space, it is scale and size, it is commodity, firmness and delight, it is the play of forms under light, etc. Together, architecture is an expression of culture. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Kovacs back to Syracuse. Um, well, that was quite the introduction, Kyle. Thank you. Um, you just kind of stole all my lines. I, I love that one. Um, but so um, it's really great to be here to present. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you to Kyle. Thank you to Dean Speaks. Thanks to everyone. Um, yeah, so I, I thought I would call this talk um, On the Edge of Architecture. So Kyle a little bit alluded to things on the periphery. And um, maybe that's kind of how I see the work we're kind of doing. And um, hopefully that becomes clearer. Um, so I guess one simple way to kind of describe what I do would be, it can be divided into two sort of steps, collection um, and production. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, he sort of didn't steal this quote from me in his intro, um, but this is a quote from Robert Venturi that I discovered in a first edition of Complexity and Contradiction as a dedication whoever, to whoever owned this book before. And I think it actually serves as a kind of um, guiding principle um, for both collection and production. So um, you don't have to like something to learn from it. Um, so as Kyle mentioned, uh, there's this project, which um, is sort of the, is the longest project that I've worked on to date. It has no deadline, no client, no budget. It doesn't really have a site either, unless you consider a website, a physical site. Um, and it exists on many different social media platforms. But it's effectively um, an image collection project. Um, and I think it starts a little bit from kind of my time here at Syracuse, where this text was very important. Um, and it was also a really great text if you had trouble falling asleep. Um, but also I think there were uh, other things that kind of started to influence the project, such as this book um, by Oswald Matthias Ungers called City Metaphors, a very beautiful book where um, each spread contains two, image, two images, one with a plan and one with uh, an, an, ana an analogous visual image. Um, but also thinking of things like this, this is um, 
uh, Saul Lewitt's uh, autobiography, um, a kind of proto Instagram maybe uh, page in uh, book format here as a kind of uh, you know nine square grid, um, and also other themed architecture blogs. For example, this one called F Yeah Brutalism. Um, also things like this, uh, Gerhard Richter's Atlas, where these collection of, collections of images become the referential material for the work that he produces. Or again, a kind of proto-blog format, this book, The Heroic Period of Modern Architecture by um, Allison and Peter Smithson, just containing the most basic uh, information, year, who did the project, uh, what the project is, etc. Um, and so Archive of Affinities is a little bit like an image bank, uh, but it's also different than an image bank. Um, and at the same time, I think it shares a kind of relationship with uh, work like this or these sort of uh, lineage genealogy charts. Uh, like th this one made by Charles Jenks in 1972. And if you look, you know, if you know, he, Charles Jenks goes on to make way more charts. Uh, in this one, he attempts to predict the future. Uh, in subsequent charts, he kind of just charts the present. So sort of um, us usual suspects that you might know. Here, a, a postmodern chart and a late modern chart made um, in the 80s. Um, I think, for me, these types of charts are a bit like this, this scene in uh, School of Rock, where Jack Black is trying to explain the relationship of music. And while I think um, that's valuable, um, for me, um, Archive of Affinities, while trying to kind of maintain in this world, also, I think, tries to slip out of it. Um, and so this Archive of Affinities is displayed in a number of different ways. First, as um, uh, a number of uh, social media sites, but also at times as exhibitions. Um, here is a wall installation at the Graham Foundation. And I would say one of the ambitions is to be inclusive as possible. Um, like what can really constitute uh, architecture? Um, at other times, the project is displayed in galleries here. For example, uh, screen printed onto a gallery wall um, that was uh, actually, Kyle mentioned this, uh, this exhibition at Jai and Jai Gallery, one of the, the, the first exhibitions that I had uh, in Los Angeles. Um, and if images were not enough, uh, I also collect uh, physical artifacts or objects here loosely arranged by color. Um, and all of the images, or the overwhelming quantity of images as well as these objects, are documented on this flatbed scanner. So this kind of really wonderful but simple machine. Um, and so these objects then are scanned in multiple views as if to suggest a kind of plan or elevation. And you know there are sort of architectural objects like columns, uh, many pieces that have say like square footprints or circular footprints, a lot of spheres, um, um, etc. And you know in kind of gathering these things. I'm also trying to say, think of other references in the history of architecture. For example, uh, this project by uh, LeCou. Um, but they also become just a way to document, archive, and collect these physical pieces. Here's a number of columns. Um, so uh, where's Richard Rosa? Uh, so, so Richard Rosa. Uh, last week or a week and a half ago uh, gave me a ride to the airport and reminded me that Archive of Affinity started at Syracuse. Um, that's kind of true, but also not true. Uh, so I took Richard Rosa's seminar, uh, and maybe the kind of beta version of Archive of Affinity started at Syracuse, right? Uh, and this was, and Richard Rosa, actually I only have two slides of this because he has a num. I gave him all the material produced in the class, and I haven't, I never documented it, and I never got it back. Uh, <laughs> and he claims, he actually claims it's very valuable now. Um, but at the time, um, I was downloading images from the internet and saving them in these image banks, uh, and then produced these very rudimentary, but as Richard Rosa might say, brilliant diagrams um, of r relationships between uh, projects. 
That sensibility, I would say, continued in collecting material. Here, a group of 25 square plans collected as part of the project of archive affinities. But at the same time, I was also looking for other material to include. So could you not read the patent drawing of the board game Clue as a nine square grid? Could you not include um, everyday objects um, as architecture? Or extreme additions? Or tall piles? Or vertical conglomerates? I hope all my students take note of this one. Um, so the project of Archive Affinity is really, I would say, so if in Rosa's class I was downloading images, uh, in 2010 I started uploading or sharing images, images that I had scanned from old media like books, magazines, etc. So this is what it looked like in 2011. It was actually quite messy um, and over time it retained its mess, but in 2016 it started to become a little bit crisper and I started to kind of theme the collection as I was sharing it. So what you might find are a number of, say, generic modernist buildings with a penchant for reflective glass, a collection of interiors, um, my personal favorite lately, um, advertisements for architecture, not the Bernard Schumi ones, but real advertisements for architecture that appear in American journals from the 1970s and 80s. And one of the things I find appealing about them is they celebrate the, the, the mundaneness of uh, architectural objects. So they kind of turn a sink into an art piece or a Rubik's cube into a cold cellar. And they, in effect, elevate um, these mundane, everyday objects into superstars. Um, of course, there are plans. I love plans. Uh, thank you, Richard Rosa. Um, but you know, rather than maybe comparing, just simply comparing these plans, I was interested in, say, the contiguity between things. So uh, maybe many of you know this image from Le Corbusier for his plan for Paris where it, it can be read as a comparison, but also as a collage of two things being pinned together, right? So um, drawing an aerial, or drawing a photograph, uh, say clean and messy, high and low, uh, linked together by uh, the highway. Um, and so this material that is collected eventually starts to become uh, these sort of architectural thought experiments or speculations. Here, a plan for a nine square grid. Uh, but using the parts and pieces and trying to retain some of their holes, right? So this one, a kind of speculative plan for a hotel where rather than the parts being fragments, that many of them remain as totalities added together to form a new whole. Or here, uh, a, a plan for a line or a plan from uh, fat to thin. Um, at the same time, physical objects are collected and oftentimes uh, displayed here a collection of uh, ready-made found columns or cubes and these um, get assembled into also speculative architecture proposals. Here um, a roadside stand to sell pears. Um, so oftentimes these models get piled up as I sort of uh, collect them. Here, just one made for fun. Um, at other times, the material collected is, becomes useful in maybe generating a conceptual proposal for a project that might happen here. I'll just quickly show these images of a proposal for a dog park. So uh, at one point, I was asked to participate in a master plan in LA. And all the serious architects were given like hotel, housing, um, and I was lucky enough to get the dog park. Um, and so it was conceived as a miniature master plan inside the larger master plan, uh, containing seven different districts um, dedicated to dog functions. Um, and I'm not going to go into it totally, but the, the, the bits, the reason I'm showing it to you is that these mini collections from Archive Affinities here, say, of eggs, 
become transplanted into the design of the dog park. Or here, um, a collection of house scrapers uh, become a kind of uh, birdhouse scraper. Um, many times these models are made just for fun uh, that end up becoming piled up into exhibitions, but the pieces of these models are also documented on the scanner. Um, so the scanner then acts as this kind of leveling or flattening device. Um, and, and here I would say sort of starts to turn the idea of collection into uh, production. So many of these pieces then are uh, kind of re reassembled here as a kind of, as a proposal for a bowling pin house or as um, these uh, instant elevations. And so these then lead to other types of projects here. Um, uh, maybe two years ago we were asked to participate in an exhibition in Hungary um, where 12 architects were asked to make uh, architectural murals inside an old school. So this was our unadorned wall. And you know we just kind of took the parts and pieces that we had, um, a kind of grid here, sort of windows, a pitched roof, added shadows, um, turned that one into brick, added the third window, a trim, a pipe, and then we drew it, and then they changed the location, but they still realized it. So this instant elevation of, say, a exterior is then projected um, onto an interior. And then here you can see some of the other contributions, and they had this whole narrative about ornament. Um, at other times, these instant, so many of these instant elevations are also recirculated on the internet through the Project of Archive Affinities. And you know, while I might be making these elevations, I might also be producing simultaneously many of these little models, which eventually get piled up into other architectural thought experiments here. Uh, proposal for collective living uh, that are displayed in exhibitions. Um, at times, the models are also maybe very, very messy. Um, here, an idea of reimagining what architecture might be where the user becomes um, an architectural mountaineer, climbing through the debris of useless architecture. Um, this is maybe the most cleaned up version of this idea, a model made for the 2017 Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, and so we were asked to make a model based off of a well-known interior. Uh, I saw Randall Corman earlier today, I don't know if he's here, but Randall Corman was the one who introduced me to Sir John Soane and his facade. Um, and so uh, I was drawn to Sir John Soane um, ever since then. And our idea was to eliminate the collection of Sir John Soane um, and imagine if Sir John Stone had lived forever, what would he start to collect? Um, and, and of course, you know, was, we thought it might be very colorful. Um, and so we sent this as our proposal before they said we could do it. And they said, how are you going to do it? And I said, we're going to freestyle it. And they said, what does that mean? And I said, um, you know, it's featuring relatively free, unrestricted movement or intended to demonstrate an individual, individual's special skill or style. And they said, okay. Uh, so we got to work collecting. Uh, this was the team, small, medium, and large. Um, <laughs> we went around um, to find architecture at 99 cent stores here at Pyramid, and they also sold Venturi's and Scott Brown's duck. Uh, we scavenged high-end paper stores for scraps, um, visited flea markets, and then produced this guide of where you might be able to go and collect things. And it was written a little bit like a Yelp review of uh, how much you might spend in certain places. So the locations ranged from the architecture model store, the craft superstore, the hobby store, the street where you could just find things for free, um, thrift stores, the internet, home improvement stores, etc. cetera. Um, and then this is what the studio space ends up looking like uh, as these objects are altered and transformed. Um, everything is cleaned, uh, things get patched, things get, glue caps get used and cut into pieces to become planters um, in this large model. This is the model maybe about a quarter of the way through. Um, here, um, 
probably also a quarter of the way through. So many of these pieces end up becoming deep, or end up, when, once the model is complete, are deep in the model and you no longer uh, see them. <coughs> and um, since we said we would freestyle it, uh, we did not make any drawings of this model. Um, so the question became, how do we generate representation for the model beyond just the physical photographs of the model? So the scanner, again, became a helpful device. Here, documenting the rubble of the model, um, producing these images of, say, a galaxy of useless dust, or here another one, uh, kind of maybe resonant to something like micromegas. Um, but also, we categorized many of the pieces, so here sort of uh, facades, pieces of paper, strips, here arranged differently, um, arranged them by color, and so this became our form of representation for the model. Uh, this is the model itself. So um, it was also conceived of as a proposal for collective living. And so if Sir John Soane's collection is meant to be viewed, here the collection is meant to be inhabited. If Sir John Soane's collection is an interior, here the collection uh, becomes an exterior. And there's also a SpongeBob. These are just shots of the model. So the model um, was, is clearly made up of many pieces and parts. Um, I was very nervous about how it would get to Chicago from LA. This is, these are photographs of the model outside LA. So one of the great things about being in LA and working in LA is that the sun is really helpful in terms of producing images and photographs. Um, and so uh, we negotiated that the model would be driven by me from uh, Los Angeles uh, to Chicago. And so this is the specifications in order to find the right truck that the model would nicely uh, fit in. And of course, I think today, the success or um, one, one measure of success of a project is how often it appears on the internet. Um, and so as part of the project, we also collected many uh, different Instagram shots by people. Uh, so for example here, Cormy Adam calls it an island of misfit architecture. Hashtag neo-postmodernism. Keon Hole says, you just don't like postmodernism. Hashtag bring postmodernism back. <laughs> M. Rose Price just said, hashtag grateful. Um, and so for me, that's really interesting. I mean, this is an old statistic, but I think it's uh, super fascinating that every two minutes, humans take more photos than ever existed in total 150 years ago, right? So in our current state, we are just bombarded with images. We are just like, there's an overwhelming quantity how do we make any sort of sense of this? If you, when Facebook, al when the Facebook algorithm for images fails, uh, this is what you, uh, you notice the things say. Image may contain tree, sky, outdoor, and nature. Image may contain flower. Image may contain night sky and outdoor. Image may contain sky cloud and outdoor, right? Sort of weird, but if you look at, say, something like this project, and the Facebook algorithm for images fails, it might say, image may contain pink wall. So um, maybe some of you know about this wall. Um, this is a store in Los Angeles, or the, uh, a location in Los, Los Angeles, uh, the Paul Smith wall, which has become this kind of Instagram backdrop. So in the era of Instagram, this is not really that new. Businesses use street art to attract customers. But there's also a kind of different type of reaction to this, right? Um, but one of the things that I most appreciate about this wall is the minute you move the camera from, say, focusing on the individual and their ideal selfie, uh, you see people engaging with architecture in a totally different way, in a totally unique way. And I think a parallel to this might be something like the Leaning Tower, where people pretend to hold it up uh, and as soon as you move the camera or zoom out, you see a number of people in strange formations um, in the landscape. Um, and 
you know, also kind of also being invested in projects of the discipline of architecture. Uh, this is a project from 1982 for a store for Calvin Klein, uh, designed by Louis Barragan. So, you know, you sort of wonder where this pink wall comes from. Um, but that leads me um, to this project, as Kyle mentioned, um, Coachella. Um, so this is what Coachella looks like normally. Um, and for many people, uh, you know, this is a really magical experience. I myself had never been to Coachella before. Um, but kind of looking, you sort of see there's a lot of peace signs in all these photos. People really kind of, you know, it seems to be a kind of um, standard there. Um, and this was our original proposal, in a way. Uh, we, had, we, had, we had conceived of making a pavilion that would provide shade, be a meeting ground, um, just made up of walls and roofs. And when we sent this in, they really liked this shape, this, the profile of a cacti here as a wall. And we then ran with it and uh, started to make other iterations. At some point, the wall or the roof went away and it became this jungle gym of cacti. The reaction on their face when they saw this was not a good one, uh, mostly due to their concerns of safety and how people might interact with it. So we pared it down even more into um, these architectural sculptures of um, very rudimentary cacti shapes. And of course, we were thinking of different types of references, also from popular culture. Here, a scene from the show Gumby, um, and also images like this. But at, while working on this project, I discovered a number of these postcards, almost, again, as like proto-selfies of people with cacti, or large, very large cacti, you know, driving these cars right up to them. Um, so this was our proposal. Um, we, again, freestyled the models, um, and this is what we sent in. And the idea was that each face might have a different color um, to provide a backdrop. Each cactus would also have a different uh, proportion and um, uh, uh, height. And so then they said, OK, can we have three more? So uh, we only sent them four, but then they asked for uh, seven. And so uh, this is what it looked like um, when it was done. Um, these are photos by Ewan Bon. And so the idea was to make a kind of plaza or meeting ground. The cacti are loosely arranged in a spiraling formation um, where people could meet, hang out, sit, people watch, dance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we were fortunate enough to be uh, centrally located, uh, so it really did act as this uh, thoroughfare in the fairgrounds. I don't know if you've ever been to Coachella, it was my first time, but it's very much like an airport and like logistically controlled. It's like a very well-oiled machine. Um, and then this is what the event became like. Um, the cacti also, it gets very hot, and so the cacti also provided shade um, for festival goers. Um, in order to, say, uh, replicate the spines of a cacti, we opted for this ready-made solution. Uh, Ready-mades is also a kind of theme in the work here. Um, road reflectors, so what you see in the medians or in the lanes between highways, um, every now and then a different colored one. And of course, people try to climb these, but they, you can't really get any grip. Um, but one of the things that happened is that it became this kind of selfie mosh pit uh, where tens of thousands of people took images or produced images with the cacti. Um, and again, like the Paul Smith wall or the Leaning Tower, what happens when you move the camera, you sort of see people engaging um, with, with the built environment in different ways. And you know, afterwards I went and like stalked the internet to see what was there, and it turns out I can buy an image of my own design for 475 euros, isn't that nice? 
Um, but I don't have to do that because all these people um, shared their images on the internet and it became this kind of amazing phenomenon. Um, and then I guess a kind of tragic end to it is, <laughs> is that recently I discovered there's this show called The Mass Singer and they also use cacti, but they didn't consult me or ask me. Um, and I've never watched the show, but in this show there's a flamingo, <laughs> I guess that dances around uh, these cacti. And look, one of the things they did was like, we, we did this in an early sketch where the arms went above the stems, right? But in our design, the stems are higher than the arms. And if you look here, this is how they treated the plinth. It's just like, a, AstroTurf rug covering it. And for their spines, rather than using found objects, they just seemingly painted um, these squares on. Um, so that was the first project in the desert. Um, the next project in the desert is called Dots. Um, and it was a collaboration between myself, Kyle May, a licensed architect in New York, and probably 20 students, architects, designers. It was a pretty intense experience and it was about, we had about a week. This is what the site looked like when we arrived. It was really um, the desert and this is what we did in about a week. Um, and so the idea here was we called it dots based off of uh, the children's game where you had these dots of columns that acted as a um, rigid, uh, rigid infrastructure which, which would then have a flexible infill. And the idea was to make um, an experimental structure that could act as a camping pavilion, right? So you could go out here into the desert and camp. Um, we didn't really produce drawings. Again, we made um, study models to, to think about what, what the pieces and parts might be. This is one of the early models here with none of the platforms elevated. Um, and then I think we had this sketch, and then we went there and did it. So it was pretty intense. Many of the team members that worked on it ended up getting a, the dots tattooed uh, on their bodies at some point afterwards. Uh, this was a, a group meeting where we um, agreed on the plan. And then we also visited a nearby junkyard to collect a number of ready-made objects as part of the flexible infill. Many of these objects were altered, um, painted, and attached onto the infrastructure. This is the plan. So um, you kind of can enter right here or right here. These, this is like existing landscape that we couldn't, we didn't want to uh, remove. Um, and then this is what the structure uh, looked like from the ground. Um, so there was a, a ramp that you could go up. There was a swing. Um, and um, you know, some of the, this, these are just yoga mats purchased from Amazon Basics. So there were parts we collected uh, from the junkyard, and then there were other parts we ordered in advance, and then like such as the columns. Uh, there was a hammock. That's the entrance. And then the, here you can sort of walk up uh, this pavilion. Um, and at the top of each of the columns um, was a mirror. Uh, reflecting the sky. Um, this is kind of how we dealt with one of the uh, plants on the site. And so these are the um, elevations of the project. So um, I would say that the project of Archive of Affinities is really this image collection project that is then circulated on the internet through various social media platforms, but also becomes um, useful in um, uh, exhibition settings. Um, and at the same time is, you know, the scanner becomes this device to collect artifacts as well. So uh, this is just a test like showing um, how the same duck can scale up. Like one of the things I love about the scanner is that if you scan a quarter at a really high DPI, you get a quarter that's larger than the actual quarter, or you get an image of a quarter that's larger. And so one, there's one, you know, one project I'm trying to do of making these instant elevations as one-to-one -one, uh, facades under a kind of scaffold. 
Um, so, you know, collection in a way slips into image production here through these um, plan-like collages or through artifact production here. This is a model made um, that was shipped from Los Angeles to Italy. And of course, over time, we, you realize that um, every time you ship a model, they just get destroyed. And it was very frustrating and annoying. So we decided to build the model in a Makita drill case, purchased on eBay um, and picked up from a pawn shop in Los Angeles for $24. Um, and this was maybe the third proposal for um, collective living. Um, at the same time, these artifacts are used in the production of architectural competitions. <coughs> so here, um, uh, one we did not succeed in in Spain to reimagine a plaza. Um, but those artifacts are then documented on the scanner as a way to uh, generate their representation, right? So rather than making drawings of these, we would just make the physical models and position them and orient them on the scanner as if to suggest a kind of elevation or a plan or a 3D view. And so as one of the ideas is to maybe scale up these found object models, miniatures, into one-to-one -one, um, constructions. And so this has happened now on two occasions, both in gallery settings here, where um, very simply we tried to make a, a two walls in this collage-like way. Um, here, kind of uh, consisting of like a ready-made window. We had to get a mason to build this. Um, but seeing if we could take these ideas and start to realize them um, at a one-to-one -one scale. And this is another version of that um, at Woodbury University um, in a uh, gallery called Wedge Gallery. I think Joel also participated in this. Um, and here we, had, we produced this model and then sent it to um, an Instagram famous artist named Aaliyah who makes these amazing videos. And she, I never met her, but we asked her if we could send her our model and if she could make a video and then send it back. And then so she did. And we then projected um, that, mod, that video on the screen. Um, the seats are basically trying to scale up very miniature knockoff Lego pieces as chairs. Um, so the ready-made also, I think, while it functions at the scale of a model, um, also has become useful in design projects. So here in the renovation of an Airstream trailer, so the Airstream itself is a kind of ready-made, but here these small ready-made pieces altered, um, rotated, and having to fit a certain uh, dimension and size become an apparatus to hang a hanger, uh, since this was to travel around and sell uh, bathing suits. Um, or more recently, um, interior uh, uh, renovations. For example, this is one we just completed in a neighborhood in Los Angeles. Um, and part, as part of that, um, the, the project um, was, was, we couldn't change the outside. The project was also like maxed out in terms of square footage. So all we could do was make a new interior, um, uh, which is a lot, actually. Um, but the, the interior had these door stops, not these, but door stops that were already there. Um, but we tried to, say, kind of turn that into a little project, where here the door stops become totem-like um, constructions. Um, and actually, these door stops are just purchased from Lowe's and then collage like for like $4, and then we just collage over them. Um, and they actually uh, function. Um, but, it, but here, maybe I'm just, this is a kind of provocation of, say, maybe trying to realize things one-to-one -one, or trying to realize these found objects um, as models one-to-one, -one, but then having them be... Um, actually functional in a project, but at the same time being used as material for further exhibitions. So for example, this as a, um, an exhibition that's upcoming at Ohio State um, curated by Outpost Office called Fulfilled. So kind of uh, city of the captive doorstop. Uh, thanks.
I know, I, I have one. Um, um, I guess, yeah, like the, that's the project, I mean, in a way, that's the project of archive fitting. So it's like, you sort of ambushed me here with showing me this. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. I, I guess I get to take it now. Right? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'm holding on to it all these years. Um, yeah, I guess, um, like, I, why, why does the canon have to be so limited, right? Like, I, I know why you might prefer it to be limited, but I guess I'm <laughs> words. Huh? wondering, like, you know, why can't we include the big orange as part of the canon? Or, or can't, why can't we expand, maybe, maybe it's not necessarily the, the, the canon still, but, um, you know, but at the same time, I'm, like, when doing this project, I was just looking, I was looking for things I had never seen before, right? And that just snowballed into continually looking for things that I've never seen before. So I don't necessarily think of myself as actually being ta a talented designer, so I have to copy things. So I have to copy things that people haven't seen or haven't seen in a while. Right, so I have to. So that's kind of why I'm always searching or looking for things um, that I that I because I'm not as good as you. <laughs> I'll say one one comment to that, and then I think we'll have to see. There, there should be plenty of questions. Um, to clarify my position on the canon, although my position doesn't matter so much here. Is, can you hear me in the back? Is on. Okay. Um, I'm not opposed to expanding the canon. My question is always simply, do, there we go. simply do we replace the canon with new models and new origins, or do we do, and I'm a fan of what you said, um, do we expand it in a snowball-like kind of capacity? But I think you start somewhere. I think there's a movement recently to maybe, that canon is, um, is irrelevant for contemporary culture, so we're, we're sort of just drawing a line in the sand and starting kind of a, a new collection of, of works in disciplinary areas to look at. But I don't think it's a big point of debate, so... No, I, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, why can't there be like a multitude of references as opposed to just like five or ten? Can we agree? Can I, I, one question I would like to pose before we maybe get questions from, from the audience, this is definitely only going on and off, yeah. is um, well, we, we discussed this a little bit. Can you explain what you find to be the, the value or utility of the work? And it's not a loaded question, as if there isn't, but since it's a different way of working, what value or utility does this have for the architect, for the student, and for the non-architect? Well, I think, yeah, I think um, the, the well, one way I would describe the project of Archive Infinities is um, not to bring people to architecture, but rather bring architecture to the people. Right, and so that's kind of how it's maybe disseminated on uh, various social media platforms, and then it, I think, the value of utility alters or changes depending on the context. So I think as a teacher, they become helpful helpful references for students that are making something. Right, so maybe a student is interested in. Maybe the, it's a parallel to music. Like maybe one student wants to make death metal, and another student wants to make country music. So <coughs> why can't I show them the best death metal and the best country music? And then maybe for me as a designer, um, it becomes not only reference material, like oh look at how that was done, but but not revered. I think you revered them, mm -hmm. and for me they become useful parts to reassemble, or recombine, or alter, and piece together into something else. Should we take questions? We have to go in sequence here. Other questions? Larry and then Leah. Great lecture. Um, my question would be, I guess particularly since your former teachers up there, you use familiarity as a way of, you know, I think, as you said, getting people into the work and comfortable with it, and also expanding the repertoire of references. Um, is there a place still for abstraction? Because abstraction is kind of, what is it? Is it dead? Because we, we spent a lot of time, you know, in this school um, trying to, uh, 
<coughs> stimulus. Okay. Um, trying to, you know, teach abstraction as a way to connect things that maybe are disconnected and create some kind of coherence. Things that are usually just jump. Yeah, I, I, you know, this is kind of the opposite approach. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's that's I learned it here in a way also, right? Like, um, so I think I had really great teachers in terms of thinking about abstraction, but at the same time, like, I think maybe there are multiple readings to things, right? Like, the cacti look like cacti, but they're pretty abstract in a way, but they also have to kind of be that way to be constructed, right? So, I don't know, maybe my take on abstraction is a little, um, I don't know, dumber. <coughs> um, I have the mic now. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I think the art is great. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of it as both horizontal and vertical. Um, so it goes way out, but it also can go deep in certain themes. I, I really enjoy that a lot. Uh, one thing that I was noticing in, particularly after you got past the archive and started showing some of these individual projects, it strikes me that there's a lot of exterior, not much interior. And in other words, what I mean by that, not interiors, but um, there's a fascination with exterior surface, and we can't get inside. And I was wondering about that. Um, you know, I'd like to get in one of the cacti, for instance, <laughs> and then find out what's in there. But you know what I mean. I, yeah, I, I go back to some of the other. <coughs> I, I, I think that's a great, great comment, and it's, it's true. Like in the physical models, you always remain on the outside of them, right? And so maybe one of the ways to think of it is that even though you're on the outside, maybe you can make an inside from two outsides, right? Or like you make an inside from one object and another object or another artifact. So how can you then maybe make them much more um, spatial? In that sense, but it's 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 it but it's it's true that in the physical models that are made up of found objects, you do always remain on the outside of them. I think maybe one stab at that maybe is the one in the drill case to try and move it at, like where it can sort of fold and you can kind of imagine it um, folded up, but sort of see it also opening. Um, and but 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 it's I, I don't yeah it's a valid point and as the models keep getting constructed it's maybe like how do you kind of position them to make them much more spatial? Yeah, there was, there just, yeah. Um, just, yeah, I was thinking first of um, the canvas canvas marshes map by Piranesi and how that's often understood as a series of. Uh, fragments and objects that collide with one another. So the space between what you're talking about is a kind of um, uh, residue, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but but, but it, it gets more complex there because of the use of elements that aren't surface elements. You know, like the polymer appears or something like that. And just, just an observation. I mean, it might be really interesting to find out what happens with that interject of the work. Yeah. There's other projects like uh, that I didn't show, say, compositions of walls that were maybe trying to become much more spatial. But, I mean, maybe the, I would say the one-to-one -one installations, you move around them, not really in them. Um, but the, the other ones are real interiors, like the house. And I, there was another one I didn't show. So we have time for maybe one or two more. Hi, um, so uh, do you find the, um, the digital space that you create through archiving as valuable as the space you create uh, between the um, cacti? Um, it's more of a personal question than because of your fascination. Try not to be still your fascination between uh, so your fascination and our archiving. I think, and gets more attention 
then this, this space you uh, you create. So there, there is this uh, fascination with the popular culture gathering, making this archive out of spontane, spontaneous uh, reaction. Uh, uh, but uh, as uh, as mentioned before, there is this um, lack of finesse, I think, in, in, in creating this space. Um, but but the simplicity is enough, perhaps. I would say um, there's an aspect of collecting material and sharing it on the internet. That material then circulates throughout the internet in whatever way it does. At the same time, that material becomes useful for me as a designer um, to make other types of speculations, right? And I would say that that material and that method is what produces the cacti, which then, in a very nice, strange way, when people take all these images with it, then gets recirculated again. Right? So, um, I don't, it might not be such a clean line, but I, I'm not sure if I also fully understand the question of which is more important. Um, I, I've, uh, I've, been, I've been a professor of uh, this class for about um, two weeks now, um, and it's... You want, to, you want to get out? <laughs> Transfer. Help me. <laughs> Help. But basically, um, it's, it's pretty obvious already um, how, interested he in, uh, how interested he is in, um, in doing us with this kind of synthesis of great established architects, and in understanding of their understanding of architecture and how to kind of combine that within a project. So um, I find it really interesting that you're interested in kind of a compiling of this archive of precedents past that point of just the established great architects. And um, I wanted to ask if um, you could maybe speak to how that might be more empathetic with people that aren't architects, people that don't understand um, Corbusier or Mies, um, and how that speaks to your architecture in relation. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, yesterday, uh, Rosa and I had this long text conversation, and he suggested that he just read that on stage, and I thought it was a great idea. Um, but in that conversation, it came up, you know, that I'm interested in broadening the audience for architecture, right? Like, I want more pe I want people to love architecture as much as this guy does. Right. Like, uh, uh, but like everyday people, right? And so when I, I think that actually happens when they engage with the Leaning Tower or the Paul Smith Wall, but they might not really know it. I think maybe at the Paul, I mean the Leaning Tower, you know, in order to kind of do that pose and get the image right, you kind of have to have some rudimentary understanding of perspective, right? To set up the photo, the camera, right? And and may, may, maybe not everyone that does that leaves with a deeper syntactical, to use Rose's word, understanding of the, that work. But I think they maybe do, they're still at the leaning tower, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess looking at, after like looking at all of this stuff, which is all <coughs> great and wonderful, um, I don't know, some of the other material also is like funny, humorous. That's another thing I appreciate about the advertisements, in a way, that they're, they're quite comical, the really good ones. Um, or you'd say every, or like the kind of duck buildings. Pe people that are not architects, I think, immediately gravitate to them because they, they're like, oh, that's cool. All right? Um, and I, I don't know, I think for me there's a way to tap into that or I would like to tap into that audience for a broader appeal. And maybe maybe that happened in the Mass Singer when they stole my cacti. Maybe, you know, maybe that's one already way of say infiltrating a larger popular culture or pop culture, um, where there's maybe a more heightened 
heightened sense of reality and a heightened awareness of the power of architecture. And do you believe that architecture can kind of speak for itself in the sense that, like, obviously, if, if a person who doesn't study architecture goes into a great piece of architecture, it's easy for them to say, this is a great piece of architecture. But we study the reason why that is. Do you think that architecture can speak for itself in a way where someone who doesn't study it will understand it farther than just that point? Yeah, but they will never understand. Like they'll, they, there still has to be initiative to, for them to do their own deep dive, I think, right? Like, I think you can go visit something like Hagia Sophia and just be like, as an architect or a non architect, and be equally blown away. I think the reasons why will be different. Um, this is maybe a bit of a general question. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on your own like personal identity and how that might propagate through your work and through your process. Because I'm thinking of sort of expanding canon uh, and it's sort of how limitless that could be. Surely there's some projection maybe of oneself. And, and I think an argu argument could be made for maybe connection with your own work being a sort of motivator for better work or for... Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, another way I've described ar archival things is like a sensibility barometer, right? Or like a way of practicing like what it is like maybe, or like to like, you know, there's that like stupid statistic like you become an expert after like doing something for 10,000 hours or something. So like, I don't know, I just want to like look at images for 10,000 hours. What happens if you look at images for 10,000 hours? Like, can you start to discern things or be critical of things in different ways or start to generate your own design sensibility of what you might be after as a designer, right? So I'm not that interested in like um, predefined agendas of what we should design, but more rather interested in like, you know, what, at least with students, like what you might be after designing, how can I help leverage that? Or in my own work, like, yeah, there's things that I like, and then like, I go look up who they liked, and who they liked, and so on, and it just, and then you find things that you might not expect to find that excite you, or challenge you in different ways. But I, I think it's also to kind of, to sort of keep developing your own taste or um, interest in as a designer. Well, then we'll take one more. I said that in five questions to open. This will be the last one. Can I need that? No. You can ask me after. No. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about um, how and how many time you spend mm. to study um, and do research on trend and culture because I assume that you do so or you just search the image randomly? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess I uh, obtain trend and culture the same way everyone does. You just, I, I, I'm not that invested in it, but, but I do, like the Project Archive Affinities requires me to go to the library often. Um, you know, like I, I go because it has to be like if it's constantly updated and uploaded, I constantly need content, right? And so I maybe I'm, maybe looking then at past trends, right, and picking up. But then of course I skim over things, I, I pass over things. But I'm like I'll go to the library and at the downtown public library in Los Angeles. And half the librarians like me, and half of them hate me. Because I'm always like, hi, could I see um, architectural record from the entire year of 1974, please? Uh, and then 20 minutes later, it comes up, and I just sit there next to the scanner and flip through it. And I'm like, that's interesting. That's interesting. I like that. That's ugly. That makes me think of this project. That, you know, that looks like some one of my colleagues did last week. Ha ha ha, I found it. <laughs> you know, so maybe, maybe maybe it's, maybe I'm like, but then I also uh, 
don't do all this work by myself. Like I have people help me or collaborators, and maybe they might be more aware of current trends. So maybe I'm like looking up past trends, but in a way that's also all part of like a cycle, right? Great. Um, I'll just end with a reminder that we'll have that the next lecture uh, Friday in the HR at five fifteen. Uh, and let's conclude by thanking uh, Richard and Amy. Thank you. raises um, the need for kind of a compliment and a clarification on this project. I think this is an extremely important, valid, intellectually deep project that Andrew does. I think it's happened throughout the history of architecture, and I think it's important to not make the distinction that because the, the colors and the toys and the objects that Andrew looks at, that it's somehow simply playful. I think it's a, it's a profoundly important project, and in addition to that, it's not about these heroes or this canon. Why it's important is because it's about teaching and developing an associative way of understanding things. Exactly what Andrew was talking about, looking for that 1974 um, set of architectural records, is as this awareness um, develops, it expands exponentially, extremely rapidly. And it's a really important thing for us as architects, artists, intellectuals, etc., to kind of have our, our, our hands in. So I compliment the project. I think it's beautiful. I look forward to its, its growth. Thanks. Thank you.